Hi, hello, and welcome to this uh, program. It's our uh, first program in English, uh, but um, we hope to have uh, many more programs in this language. Um, so this program, uh, we are talking about sacred music. Uh, sacred music, that is a topic that is always very uh, interesting for debates because there are so many people with many different opinions, even if for Catholic we should uh, stick to the directives coming from the church. But today we will discuss especially uh, about uh, my own uh, book, uh, Forever I Will Sing, a short history of Catholic sacred music. Uh, as uh, we, we discuss uh, with uh, uh, one of the guests uh, is short uh, only, I mean, it's only uh, some to say short because it's more than 350 pages. So it's quite long, but short in the sense that uh, it's a book that uh, uh, talk about uh, the history of music from the first century to now. So it's really uh, trying to summarize as much as possible this very long uh, period of time. And I'm very happy to be joined by two special guests. Uh, one is uh, Professor Guido Milanese, that uh, is uh, Italian uh, musicologist, uh, and he's uh, a professor in the uh, Catholic University in Italy, in Milan, and uh, also is the editor in chief of the Studi Gregoriani magazine that we may translate as a Gregorian Chant Studies magazine uh, that uh, belong to the Italian Association for uh, uh, the Studies on Gregorian Chant. So it's a, a very important magazine. And then uh, I'm also happy that uh, we are joined by Dr. Horst Buchholz. He is the Vice President of the Church Music Association of America and also is the uh, director of music of the cathedral in St. Louis. So thank you both for uh, joining us for this uh, uh, conversation. My pleasure. My pleasure, of course. And uh, I want to uh, start uh, um, just uh, telling a few things. Uh, for the one that are listening, if you want to comment or you have a question you can comment in facebook or in uh, uh, or in youtube uh here i show you our media and now we are in youtube in chorus master i really uh, encourage you to like this channel again it is quite new and we re really need more likes then we have ritorno itaca and aurelio Volfiri. this uh, is our presence in uh, YouTube. Then we have several groups in Facebook, uh, Facebook Association of Choral Conductors, Music and Education Academy, Musicologia, Theologia, Liturgia and Musica Sagra. And if you want to be always updated by uh, from uh, about coming events, you can go to Telegram and look for Aurelio Porfiri's channel. And you can join the channel and so you will always receive a notification when there are new programs or new <coughs> events that need uh, your attention. So, uh, as I mentioned to you, today we will discuss about this book, uh, Forever I Will Sing, A Short History of Catholic Sacred Music. Uh, if my guests agree, I will just say a few words about the origins of this book and then we can go into some part of it uh, together. Uh, the origins of this book indeed are because of uh, an invitation I have received from the Center for Catholic Studies at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, they asked me to do a course on the history of Catholic sacred music. And uh, I say, oh, okay, that will be interesting. And so we may also do a book about this course and uh, so i uh, decide to write the book about the that uh, you know collect uh, uh, 
uh, my lesson in the course, of course, expanded uh, with more material. And, uh, and so I write, uh, I write the book in English. Then the book was translated in Chinese. So this book is available also in Chinese. Uh, you can see here, this is the book version in Chinese and the, the cover, a very beautiful cover is from uh, a modern Italian painter called Giovanni Gasparro. This is Saint Elizabeth of the Trinity and uh, uh, really beautiful one, one of the, you know, the most famous painter is younger than me. So it's, you see there are young artists that still can do very good work of art and this is the same for music i mean uh, so and uh, and so as i say um i wrote the book they translated i i want to uh for one moment also show if, if there are chinese viewers and if they want to have the book in chinese uh they can write to this email address catholic at c u c u h k dot edu dot hk so this is the address for the chinese version of the book i will let this go for some time so all the people that are interested in the chinese version they can uh, uh, they can ask information there also i want to mention that uh, uh, i was lucky that the book as a preface by cardinal uh, burke uh, Cardinal Raymond Leo Burke, he, he wrote a preface, a very nice preface, and uh, he was very supportive also of uh, my uh, working on this book that, of course, he was a kind of enterprise because, uh, you know, it's a very sizable book and uh, it's a sort of handbook. Uh, of course, it's not everything there, but it's not possible. I mean, every chapter of the book can be an encyclopedia i mean because there are so many topics but for those that want to have a rough idea of the development of catholic sacred music i think the book is a good starting and uh, of course i mean not everything is there and that is not possible that there are topics maybe that are missing or uh, things uh, maybe say better okay but it's still i, I don't know many other books like my book that uh, start from the first century and go into the 21st century uh, talking about uh, this topic so i think it's uh, a quite nice thing uh now i would like to uh, touch with you a little about the origins of uh, uh, what we call gregorian chant because indeed, uh, many people give for granted the origin of Gregorian chant. Uh, we call it Gregorian chant also uh, as a, con a conventional way, of course, to call this, because uh, we know very well that was not Gregory the Great that uh, was in charge of doing, you know, the songs, even if maybe he may have some responsibility in the development of liturgical singing, but Gregorian chant is something that will come much later. The scholar call it Frank-Roman chant uh, because this is the uh, the union between uh, the old Roman chant and uh, uh, the working of the Gallican singers, so their embellishment. But also, you know, this is a theory that comes from the French uh, musicology time. There are others that don't agree with this. So uh, I want to start with Professor Milanese. And uh, um, what is the, the, the perception from your side about the origin of what we call conventionally Gregorian chant? Well, let me say before beginning that I did like your book and i read it in the in the, not in the printed version but uh, uh, of course uh, there is not everything there as you mm -hmm. mentioned before um, well I, i'm i'm very interested in this point because in another field i have just published a manual of 350 pages in a different field so uh, i know the problem of writing a manual because uh, uh, sometimes you have the feeling, well, uh, I'm writing a lot of platitudes. 
needs, you know. But on the other side, you know that you cannot transform a textbook, a manual, into a sort of encyclopedia, a sort of well, where you put everything that has been written about top this topic you are dealing with. So um, um, I repeat, it's it's a, it's a good book, and I heartily recommend it. Also for all other translations, why not? Other translations may be may be useful in uh, in different areas, say in French, Italian, or um, I don't know German because in in Germany there is a lot of of books about history of, of sacred music. So yeah. I, I don't know, but uh, since I teach in uh, the town where I live, I live in Genoa, even if I teach in uh, in Brescia, Milan, and in Switzerland. But in the town where I live, uh, I I have a a, 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 t a chair of history of, of church music in the local university for, you know, for it's not a seminary, it's a sort of university faculty for um, teachers of religion in schools and so on. So I think that it could be useful indeed. About Gregorian Chan now, um, I read the chapter and uh, it, it is well balanced because it does not give the wrong impression that there might be one and only one view of seeing exactly. the yes. historical developments. Personally, I share the so-called traditional view. Um, in other words, I, I see the, the origin of Gregorian chant basically as a political and a cultural move. Uh, that's why the reason why in in my studies I frequently call Gregorian chant the imperial chant, because it was the voice of Charlemagne Empire, um, and the political project was of course to join forces uh, with the Pope, and since at the time liturgy had a tremendous effect on the life of people, high level, of course, people. So the clergy, the monks, uh, the aristocracy, and so on. It was important to develop a sort of new liturgy that was not completely new because it was merging different tra the two different traditions. And also, as a great Italian scholar, uh, Baroffio, um, um, was able to show about, uh, well, 50 years ago, because it was his uh, uh, dissertation, there was a lot of influence from the South, from Spain, because uh, uh, the relationship of the um, uh, North, uh, particularly the Toledo area, um, with the uh, France was very strong and uh, there were musicians and liturgists that moved to the southern area of France and uh, some pieces, particularly all the uh, all the offertories are frequently written in in uh, in Spain, and uh, so this is my point of view. Baroffio follows another another tradition of historical reconstruction, uh, basically by his uh, professor in Germany, who was uh, Stäblein. The idea of Stäblein was that um, it was not a, an issue of a combination of uh, Gallican and Roman chant, but there were uh, different versions of the same Roman chant. I find it very difficult to believe, personally. I, I still believe in the uh, so-called Roman Frank hypothesis. It seems to me um, much, much easier. Um, you know, uh, when for uh, to show the uh, the reasons of a historical reconstruction, you need two or three hypotheses. And for another one, you need 25. Probably the first is better. <laughs> that's, that's why I, I still believe in the Roman, Roman Frank hypothesis. But indeed, and, uh, sorry. Mm. 
No, I'm no, glad no, no. you mentioned you mentioned about uh, uh, Barofio because indeed, uh, uh, Professor Barofio, I have several mm. conversations with him exactly about this topic, and uh, uh, for me, uh, it's important when uh, these kind of topics that uh, we don't have. <coughs> sorry, we don't have so much uh, historical evidences are at least not contaminated with ideology because uh, uh, when there is ideology so when people want to believe something and they really i mean uh, historical res research is not a fit so you don't have dogma uh, you you can still say but I think one topic uh, we will go later is not only about the origins that uh, as I'm glad you recognize that I was at least prudent about that, but it's about interpretation, you know, that that is the, the war, the, the, the worst war. But before going to interpretation, I, I want to ask uh, uh, Dr. Buchholz, what is his own uh, uh, take about this topic? Well, uh, for me, it's actually interesting uh, that uh, something that I've uh, discovered only over the last few years, in addition to the Gregorian chant, is the uh, chant of Milan. So we have Professor <laughs> Milanese here. And um, I was in Milan uh, <laughs> a couple of years ago and um, I says, well, uh, on Sunday I want to go to Mass. Where is the best place to hear some Ambrosian chant? And my colleague in Milan said, good luck with that. <laughs> it's something that is almost completely gone. And it would be interesting, I think, to trace uh, um, the history of the Ambrosian chant, and is there any connection? I know it is slightly older, and I've actually uh, um, uh, added some uh, Ambrosian chant to the Gregorian chant repertoire that we have been singing here at the cathedral on occasions, like uh, some of the chants post-evangelium after the gospel, uh, and people say, oh, well, what was that? And so people uh, actually find it very interesting to hear this repertoire, whether it's Gregorian or Ambrosian, um, and it is uh, remarkable for me to see how much that music still speaks to the people. Uh, sorry, if I may uh, uh, not interrupt you, but just add something to what you say. Indeed, uh, for those that can uh, read uh, Italian, I about Ambrosian chant, I really would suggest the studies by Monsignor uh, Alberto Turco because uh, he did uh, very nice books. Uh, about also the Ambrosian chant and he devoted uh, studies on this. So uh, for the one that uh, can read Italian, that uh, can be a good uh, reference. But indeed, uh, we, we don't have only Ambrosian chant. You know, you know we have uh, uh, many other uh, monodic repertoires that, uh, you know, are also a very, um, very uh, important for our understanding of what was the conception of sacred music uh, in uh, uh, earliest time. Because what I really notice on my book is that uh, despite the time I was studying, uh, the Catholic Church has always devoted a lot of attention and resources to sacred music and liturgy. This was always the case from the time of the freedom of worship uh, with the uh, Emperor Constantine and then uh, the following, uh, the church devote devo a lot of material resources, you know, building churches, uh, uh, forming uh, vocal groups, choirs, uh, singers, uh, liturgical, uh, liturgical aids and whatever. So this was uh, yeah. really something that came throughout history, but it was somehow I don't want to say interrupted because now still they are doing churches, they are doing uh, books by, for uh, singing, they are doing all this stuff, but they are not so much concerned about the quality. I, I don't know uh, if I... Yeah. Uh, so they, they just are very functional. Oh, we need to sing, okay, uh, let us do this song, whatever it is the origin of the song, uh, or if the song is good or not, uh, good quality or not. So this is something I think we will go uh, very soon. But before, I want to touch with you about the topic of interpretation of chant, because this is uh, one of the very hot topics of discussion. Yes. If, 
If I, I may uh, just interrupt one thought here, uh, I was yeah. very grateful that in your book you mentioned the um, uh, publication, the papal legislation on sacred music. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I have that <laughs> book also, and some people find that terribly boring. I find it very fascinating. Yeah, very useful. Mm -hmm. Over the centuries, like some of the problems that we have today, uh, why is music that sounds like secular pop music uh, inserted into the church? Well, that has been a long-standing tradition, a bad tradition maybe, uh, uh, in the church for centuries. And uh, the church has always addressed uh, um, that uh, um, the music should be beautiful, should be sacred, uh, that we use of the liturgy. So it's, it's, I find that very fascinating to read that. Yeah, indeed, that is that was very helpful for me uh, to, you know, because uh, collect a lot of documents from many eras, and so uh, for me it was easier to find because uh, when you uh, when uh, I have to write a book like this, I mean, really twenty one centuries is a long time with very different uh, uh, historical uh, backgrounds and things, so it's very very complicated book to write. But, but I, I want to mention about the interpretation of Gregorian Chen. Uh, in the other, uh, one of the past broadcasts, uh, Professor Milanese was also present. Uh, we discussed about Gregorian Chen, but I mentioned I don't want to discuss about the interpretation because uh, if we discuss about the interpretation, we'll, we will have some troubles. Um, especially for Gregorian Chen, but not only, because also about Renaissance. Uh, you know, about Renaissance, we have, uh, I mean, we are Italian, me and Professor Milanese, and we have uh, a, a huge uh, uh, tradition with Renaissance music. Uh, uh, we have some of the most important composers, and so, uh, and, and also, you are German, so you have other, I, I mean, uh, or we have uh, our own uh, way of understanding about uh, the, the way of uh, performing this kind of music. For Gregorian chant, as we know, the prevail, uh, uh, prevalent school of interpretation is the one by the solemn, the so-called solemn method. But I think that for some, uh, maybe the solemn method is a little becoming a sort of ideology. So uh, this, uh, what I mean is that, of course, solemn as a great, um, you know, has to be praised for the work they did about Gregorian chant, for the research on the, uh, um, the original melodies, uh, but also within Solem, there are different ideas. Uh, so even among the, the months, it's not that they all think the same way, because even from the beginning, we know very well that from Don, uh, between Don Mokro and Don Potier, they have a different conception and so going on. Uh, so I, I want to hear the opinion of Professor Milanese first about this. Yes, again, not, not to repeat uh, to repeat my praise to your work, but uh, um, uh, there is a page where you cite the, again, this uh, great Italian scholar Baroffio, who says we'll never know uh, how the, the the you know the actual sound of Gregorian chant was, and um, it, it is not only for Gregorian chant; uh, it's uh, it's for any any music before us, really. I made an, an experiment in a lecture years ago, and I used one of the surviving uh, tape recordings at, of the beginning of the twentieth century. And uh, the author was playing his own music, may have been Debussy, I'm not sure. And uh, the audience uh, commented, well, this man is not able to play. <laughs> and of course, because it's a matter of the sound that we have within us. We have a different sound in uh, our brain and uh, also in the physical perception of sound. So um, it's it's uh, it's uh, it's impossible to reproduce exactly the, uh, no not exactly just to reproduce the sound of music as it was. Just let me let me <clears throat> make an example. Uh, take uh, Machaut Mass the Notre Dame. 
four singers in a huge cathedral. Of course, either they had incredible voices or simply people were used to a lower volume level. It's, it's a matter, as in the theater, for example, when they didn't have electric light, of course they could use candles, but uh, uh, they had uh, hundreds of candles together. But of course, the visual, visual effect was completely different. So this is the first point. Second point is that, as you mentioned, this, can, this becomes very easily sort of ideology. Um, um, what I see very frequently uh, within circles of people interested in, uh, in liturgy, they have a real interest in liturgy, is that they believe, they strongly believe, that the way of singing of the uh, so-called solemn tradition, uh, tradition is a sort of uh, tradition of uh, of the of the chant since the Middle Ages to our to our time. This is of course a nonsense, because the solemn method was invented um, about one hundred twenty years ago, just to make it possible to perform. Gregorian chant to those who were not able to do it. And um, 25 years ago, I translated into Italian a short article by Dom Jean Claire, who at the time was the director of music at the Solemn Abbey, where he plainly explained that Solemn had never followed the Solemn method. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was no, never, 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 because and also um, a German professor told me once that he asked in France, "I want to go to Solem to uh, n to um, you know to hear the Solem method." So the answer was, "Don't go to Solem, go to Ligugier, was another another abbey." And an important point is also that the sound of the chant of the uh, late antiquity and of the early Middle Ages was very different because it was normal to practice the chant with the other voices, not only with one voice. This is a mistake. And I think I should translate into English, maybe for antiphon, I don't know, I'll, I'll have a talk with Father Lang about it, uh, because uh, in the ancient texts, um, not only Augustine, but, but even earlier sources, uh, we know that the main melody was of course the same, but other singers could add, um, for example, the same, the same melody at the upper, upper fifth, or they could add a long a long voice uh, such as it happens in the Eastern Church now. We will never know how it was performed. We will never know, but we know but, that there was not this idea of one voice for everyone. No. Yeah, but also yeah, there, there is, uh, there is uh, I think one thing I want to add, uh, 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 before I go to the, <clears throat> um, to uh, Dr. Buchholz, and this this. Uh, I also uh, uh, I have the occasion to see a video uh, from a very good website uh, that uh, play uh, a piece of music uh, uh, was like opera uh, as was performed uh, really at the beginning of recording and as it is performed now and the differences are huge but this does not mean that what was done at the beginning was not good it just mean that they have another idea of music respect what we have now because now we have the cult of the experts so uh, we have uh, these people that are musicologists and they know how to every note to sound but this is not really what music is about they have much more freedom they were used to improvise so improvisation was a big part of their music making and it was also used in the actual 
performance of composition by other people. We know also, for example, Renaissance, uh, Renaissance music, uh, they, uh, when they perform it, there were a lot of embellishments that uh, we call it passaggi, you know, all these things. There are also treatises about this, uh, how to do these things, you know, how to make these uh, uh, embellishments. But today we don't do that. Uh, and also uh, we are used to uh, temperament, you know, uh, but of course in medieval time they don't. Uh, so the, the, the kind of sound was very different. We are used to the... Uh, for under 40 uh, for the, the pitch, uh, but they don't have this. So we know, uh, uh, Professor Milanese can confirm, I think I, I speak about this in the book, that uh, uh, we have uh, uh, many references in musical treatises from uh, 17th century when they refer about the corista, so the, 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 the pitch you need to follow, they say, oh, every city has one different. So you go to Rome, it's lower, you go to Naples, maybe higher. So, uh, you know, uh, sometimes we are too tied to our ideological understanding and to our modern understanding of music that is really um, not uh, uh, maybe the best help for a very uh, authentic, if this word authentic that is very dangerous to use, uh, very authentic performance. I would just want to add one more thing, and then I want to hear Professor Buchholz, uh, Dr. Buchholz's opinion. Um, uh, I, we mentioned before about this uh, musicologist, the French musicologist called uh, Jacques Viret, uh, that I uh, write a book uh, with him about uh, music, and then now we finish a new book about modality. Uh, then uh, Professor Viret he wrote a preface to another of my book that is coming up soon about the tradition of music in the Sistine Chapel choir. And uh, he wrote something very interesting. Uh, he wrote, uh, you know, uh, uh, there is this very famous recording uh, from the last uh, castrato, no? Uh, Moreschi. Uh, this very famous record, the last castrato is called the recording. And many people criticize. You know, they say, oh, you see how we sound, there are all these uh, uh, portamenti, uh, how you say in English, uh, you know, this, uh, uh, you know, portamenti. Oh, uh, yeah. And, uh, but he say correctly, but this was the way they perform this kind of music. They really uh, were more expressive than we are. Today, we, we are afraid of being, of being expressive. Uh, I remember, I don't want to mention names, but when I was organizing St. Peter's Basilica, they said, oh, you need to sing soft Gregorian chant, very soft. But this is really a very romantic idea of Gregorian chant, not like the angels singing from far afar. And the, no, it's not this. Medieval people, they were also warriors. You know, they were, they, they were not... Uh, 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 there is that book, uh, I think, by uh, who is uh, Huizing, I think, uh, the, the, uh, about uh, medieval time. Uh, the, he, he write, the, these people like colors, uh, like, uh, you know, they were not, uh, you know, so, you know, very soft, uh, very, no, they were not like that. So I, I think uh, really there are very big uh, misconceptions about how to interpret. And uh, um, and there are, of course, even in places where, like Germany or Italy or France, where there is still a strong tradition. So I can imagine that in countries where they don't have these traditions, these problems may be even bigger, because they they will always to rely, you know, on other people uh, sources. So uh, sorry for this uh, interlude. And uh, Dr. Buchholz, uh, I want to know your opinion. Well, uh, before I uh, say something about uh, uh, my take on the interpretation of chant, I uh, want to um, say one thought here, uh, um, listening to what we just spoke about. Uh, I mean, in the Catholic Church, especially in the um, field of dogmatics, we are so concerned with finding absolute truths. That's very often uh, uh, we must define something as good or bad, or this is better and this is worse. 
And so if we listen to different interpretations, um, can we first of all agree that they are just different? And then see, okay, I can see this and this is, ah, actually they have more in common than they differ. And then we can talk about the differences. But very often we uh, immediately want to put a label on this. Uh, this is not good or, or this is this is better. So that's, I think, uh, uh, my take on that. Now, when I grew up in Germany, um, uh, it was uh, right after uh, Vatican II. Um, I uh, uh, still heard a lot of Gregorian chant uh, sung in, in my hometown. But of course, it was the older uh, um, equalistic approach to chant. It was beautiful. It was frequently accompanied by the organ. Uh, um, uh, but the, uh, the way they preserved it after the council uh, was quite uh, um, interesting. And then when I studied church music uh, uh, um, uh, in Berlin later, um, um, I got to study with some wonderful uh, um, chance scholars, and they were all uh, scholars of uh, Kardin. Gudat uh, Joppich, uh, um, Heinrich Rumpost was one of my teachers there. Uh, and of course, Augustoni, I mean, uh, Gershel, I mean, these are all the, that's the same school. Uh, so we really had to look at every little noom over there and uh, interpret our chant. And then, um, when I came to the United States, yeah, and especially within the Church Music Association of America, it was definitely more of the mock row method. Uh, and that is still, I think, uh, the prevailing method if you find a uh, chant sung at all. And nowadays, I mean, even at the colloquium of the CMA, uh, we do have uh, groups that study semiology uh, uh, and, and do that as well. But I think the uh, more common way of, of singing is definitely according uh, uh, to the mock row method. And um, I had a wonderful encounter with a, a Benedictine uh, monk uh, here in the United States. Uh, and, uh, and I asked him, and he's a chance scholar, and I asked him, uh, uh, well, what do you do in your abbey? And he said, uh, well, Horst, coming from Germany, you used to understand perfectly well the principle of peaceful coexistence. Because uh, when I have my scholar with five or six singers, we can look at every little noom and try to interpret that. But when I have a hundred monks together, I'm happy if they sing one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. So it can be both done and this is under the same roof. So I, I think uh, that is maybe uh, one approach that uh, um, I find uh, very noteworthy. But, uh, you know, I, I think it's, uh, what is very interesting about this is, first of all, uh, I don't mean, uh, in one side, I mean, we should not be dogmatic about interpretation and be open to possibilities. This does not mean that every possibility is good. Uh, so, uh, uh, of course, there are, I don't want to mention names, but there are famous choirs or, or they, and they sing this kind of music in a way that, uh, I mean, it's really the, out of any uh, possible understanding. But there are other, for example, uh, I mentioned already, and uh, uh, Professor Milanese and I were talking with Marcel Peresh uh, of the Ensemble Organum in the other program, and I find really fascinating because Marcel Peresh is not only a very, I mean, good performer, but he's also a musicologist. So what he do he can justify it and um of course uh, you can disagree you can say oh but your uh, your justifications are not uh, good for us but he is doing something that uh, is not uh, out of the blue uh, we may say so and also uh, about the thing of uh, mokro yes i also noticed that in the united states still many are uh, relying on that even if uh, and Professor Milanese can correct me if I'm wrong, even if even in Solemn, they never follow really that kind of uh, singing. Uh, 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 Professor Albarosa, that is uh, another great scholar of Gregorian chant, uh, um, still alive, but now is not very good health. Uh, he uh, told me that uh, the, the Mokro method was not, uh, not even followed in Solemn. Uh, because uh, and here in Europe, I think now uh, the prevalent uh, school is the one of Don Cardin. Uh, so um, more, it's very rare 
you, you find people that uh, you know don't at least try to follow some of Don Cardin. But I, I really think that Don Cardin, what he did is very fascinating. I mean, I'm very fascinated, my, my personal opinion, I don't know if it comes from the book, first from Don Potier. I think Don Potier was a very interesting character and his book, uh, uh, Le Melodie Grégorienne, is a very interesting book because he say thing, things that for me are still relevant today. And also uh, I am very fascinated by Don Claire because uh, personally uh, I, I really like the modality, the studies on modality. I study a lot of modality and one of my teacher was a uh, great uh, uh, composer using modality. So uh, I really like it. And uh, and also Don Cardin. I, I think he's a very, they are very interesting scholar, but I, I also think that, uh, uh, you know, what they did should be open to evaluations. And uh, we are talking a lot about uh, uh, Gregorian Chant, uh, referring to my book, this book we are presenting that is here, you can see on the right of your screen, uh, forever I will sing a short history of, of Catholic circle music. And, uh, but we need also to uh, consider that uh, uh, Gregorian chant, especially in the last decades, has known a uh, huge problem uh, because of, the, of what happened around the Vatican II. I don't want to say because of Vatican II. I know many people would say like that. They would say, oh, because of Vatican II. I don't think it's that, because we know very well that uh, Sacrosanto Mucilio say that Gregorian chant is the official song of the church. So I think it's a quite clear statement, uh, at least for uh, what I, but uh, this was not the case. Uh, I think also should be re-evaluated the, the liturgical and musical teachings by Pius the Twelfth, because of course we talk a lot about Pius the Ten because of the motu proprio 1903, but Pius the Twelfth also write a lot about uh, sacred music and liturgy, and then there was the instruction for sacred music and sacred liturgy 1958 that summarized his teachings. Um, I want to know if uh, any of you want to add something about uh, Pius the Twelfth. Um, may I add just a couple of words, yeah. um, if possible? Yeah. Yes, um, uh, you see that uh, I have a photograph here above my head. Uh, he was a cardinal when I was younger, when I was a child in my town in Genoa, and was a cardinal Giuseppe Siri, who was um, apparently the, the best pupil of, of Pacelli. And uh, um, I'm very grateful to his memory because many, many churches in this town have never interrupted a tradition. So they, for example, in my parish church, uh, we have the vernacular, we have a lot of, of vernacular, but uh, we never interrupted the tradition and uh, this was uh, this is the great heritage that we have from pacelli i would also um, add another name which can be not very very well accepted by by most uh, traditionals but uh, but uh, montini himself paul the sixth wrote very very wise statements about about music he was very interested in church music and in in particular in chant um, i remember commenting about about it with dom cardin himself more than 30 years ago and so i think that there is a liaison a good a good link uh, between uh, uh, Pacelli and uh, and uh, Montini himself, because they had this sort of, of interest. The problem for me is that there was a huge mistake, not by the Vatican, uh, the Second Vatican Council, but at the beginning of the 20th century, where where well they were fascinated by these discoveries on the 
medieval music, medieval architecture, and so on. And they wanted to impose a sort of universal music to the church. And of course, it was an artificial move. Um, I had again used this uh, citation before in another talk, but read what John Henry Cardinal Newman writes about architecture. Because one goes to London and see the Palace of Parliament and say, oh, this wonderful medieval architecture. It isn't medieval. There are two, two or three stones. <laughs> but it's, it's, a, it's a, a 19th century building. So uh, Newman notices that the same was being done also in other fields, including music. Uh, it was a mistake because there was a living tradition a living tradition of performing chant. I agree with Marcel Peresh in avoiding uh, as often as possible the word Gregorian chant and use plain chant, which is broader. Uh, you know, it's not, it's, um, it doesn't imply that you are following a particular book, so to say. Um, there was a living tradition of Gregorian chant performed in many different ways. And the idea of having one book for everyone, you know, um, was the same as with uh, uh, philosophy. Um, uh, we all must study Aquinas. I like Aquinas. I studied Aquinas when I was 16, all right? Mm -hmm. And I, I regard him as the, uh, the probably the the one of the best brains in the history of human civilization but this having been said there is not only him and uh, um, so the same applies to music the mistake was done when there was this idea one music for everyone and that's why they invented the solemn method to make this sort of you know a dream of dream possible and it didn't work it lasted two generations it lasted two generations. Then, of course, after the Second Vatican um, Council, there was a lot of ideology, but this would be another topic, not for, for now. Yes, and also uh, I want to mention that uh, um, I think at the beginning of the uh, 20th century and uh, in, still in the, already in the middle of the uh, 19th century, we had the... Um, you know, we have also the influence of romantic ideas. So uh, this idea that we have to go back to uh, El Dorado times where uh, everyone was, uh, th this is also the problem we discussed before now about the, the early church, you know, where everyone was peaceful, everyone loved each other. But I mean, that's not really true. We, we know that uh, they have very big disagreements. Uh, we, we can see from the letter of St. Paul also, you know, where they say, oh, you have people do this, do that. So I, I think uh, uh, many of these movements that also were born in 19th century were also influenced by these ideas, you know, by these ideas of the... Uh, the music, we, we need to sound as in the Middle Age. But, I mean, uh, we, we cannot because we don't know how they sound. Uh, you know, we can just try to do the best we can with the information we have to make, in a way, not to betray the spirit of that kind of music. That, that is already something important. Of course, we need to, to, to use as much as possible information, but... Uh, we, we, we really should be careful about ideology. And I don't know if uh, uh, Dr. Buchholz, you want to add something about uh, Pius XII? Well, uh, Pius XII, of course, uh, was part of this stream uh, of reformers that led into Vatican II. I mean, today there are still people who think that Vatican II fell from heaven or so. But, uh, um, of course, we know from uh, even Pius X uh, until uh, uh, Vatican II, there is a stream. And it begins in the 19th century, if we want to talk a bit about, about the Sicilian movement or things like that. But um, um, I think uh, there were a lot of uh, um, gradual changes that happened. For instance, the dialogue mass, uh, where people were more uh, engaged. Uh, uh, this is prior to, uh, to Vatican II. And, and when we see now the return to the old Latin mass or the extraordinary form, as it is called officially, they go back way uh, before that. So uh, even some of the reforms prior to Vatican II uh, are not being incorporated. 
So that's an interesting uh, uh, um, phenomenon, uh, I think. So I think to look at this whole uh, um, stream of reforms, uh, including uh, um, uh, um, Pius XII, but also the other reformers uh, in the 20th century, it's, it's maybe worth uh, revisiting. But uh, did you want to talk a little bit about the uh, Sicilian movement uh, as, as well? I mean, go on. Go on. Yeah, I, I found that uh, very fascinating because it comes out of the 19th century, the, uh, this romantic uh, uh, um, fascination of antiquity, uh, um, the, uh, the looking back. Uh, um, the, uh, before that, it was not possible uh, to have any music that was unfinished. Here, it was fantastic. Oh, the composer died over this. We adore this because while we hear these notes, he probably breathed his last and people bow and, and, and find the torso uh, 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 kind of fascinating. I mean, uh, we thought that uh, um, antique statues that had lost their arms or their nose or so, uh, they were uh, imperfect. Now uh, we admire the torso. Uh, that's kind of something that happened in the 19th century. So looking back, I think the Sicilian movement uh, um, found uh, um, the music of the, the Renaissance, again, that had been lost uh, for years. And also the first uh, uh, um, serious uh, scholarly uh, uh, um, approaches of a chant uh, happened uh, uh, during that time. So it, it started in, in, in Germany, but then it spread relatively quickly into other countries. I mean, even uh, the shortly after the Sicilian movement in Germany, a, a couple of years later or so, there was a Sicilian movement that started uh, here in the United States as well. And so all that, uh, I think, prepared uh, uh, a long path uh, of uh, reforms um, and uh, reformation of the repertoire uh, um, that... You had Singerberger, no, how's called the name of the... The well, world. there were two groups. I mean, there was the um, St. Cecilia Guild, yeah. and uh, um, then there was another one, uh, um, the uh, um, St. Gregory something. St. Gregory uh, uh, yeah. Association. And they both merged after Vatican II into uh, what we now have as the Church Music Association. Ah, okay. Ah, okay. And I just want to add something on uh, what you were saying. And indeed, if you look at the first composition, I, we may say under the umbrella of the Sicilian movement, even if maybe they don't belong to, the, to this movement, uh, they were trying to copy the formula of Renaissance music. Mm -hmm. not, not, not the spirit, but the formula. You know, mm -hmm. if you look composers like uh, Michael Haller or other, I mean, they, they, they were quite skilled, but th there was no soul because it was just trying to reproduce an atmosphere mm -hmm. uh not really to you know to to bring something new but uh, um I, I want to uh, uh, one moment uh, talk uh, about uh, uh, what we have now because after uh, vatican ii even in the country where you are but also in the country where we are uh they start to uh think that uh, sacred music should uh, include the commercial music so here in italy we have what they call the the uh, beat masses uh and they already start very early i think the first one i also wrote about this about should be 1967 if i i'm not incorrect 1967 so even before the 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 actual new mass that started in 1969 so uh and in your country also uh the uh, in, in the country where you are sorry uh also there were many of these uh, guitar uh, because they say oh we we need to do music that people we need to speak with the language of the people but uh, this is a, a a very false a, a statement because most of the time you are not speaking with the language of the people you are speaking with the language of uh, big musical corporations or with the taste that is imposed by very big commercial interest uh, so uh, and you know often the music that is performed in church is not even of the quality you hear you know, in this big uh, pop concert. Of course, it's a much poorer quality. And uh, I, I really need, and the last thing is, this commercial music uh, to sell more, 
need to uh, you know to to marry values that people uh, you know look for so like sex and the money and things so to repropose the same kind of language of musical language with the word of the mass i think it's really stupid because even if the word change but your mind we, we know from neuromusicology your mind will always associate with what the music is really saying if you sing uh pater noster uh, our father with the word of a pop song that uh, you know is uh, uh, about a sexual pleasure like this I, th I think it's very difficult that you will not think about that kind of input so i, I want to know uh, what is your opinion on this well it, it's very interesting um to see that the same documents that everybody refers to, the uh, documents of the liturgical reforms uh, of Vatican II, have been interpreted in so many different ways. And uh, um, I've spoken about that, I've not written about that yet, but people ask me to write an article about that. Uh, how different, for instance, uh, uh, the reforms were perceived uh, uh, and initiated uh, in Germany uh, um, versus the United States. Here we have the document that says, Okay, a uh, uh, Gregorian chant, uh, pride of place, as it's uh, uh, um, um, translated in English, primary place would probably be the better uh, translation. Uh, other things being equal. Aha, okay, I forget about the first uh, sentence. I uh, uh, focus on the second sentence. Okay, um, uh, the mass can be done in the vernacular, but uh, um, the Latin language should be kept in the Roman rite. Okay, I just take that part of the sentence and I ignore the other one. You see where this is going? So I think in, in Germany in particular, um, there was a different musical landscape around Vatican II. When they read uh, um, the treasure of inestimable value should be preserved and kept, uh, they had something to keep. And they were saying, okay, we can keep our music. We have the mass in German, uh, but the music... Uh, musical tradition stays alive. Now, in the United States, there were probably a few wonderful uh, places with music, and there still are at this day. But the average uh, church uh, probably had second-class music uh, by third-class composers uh, performed by fourth-class musicians. And so, uh, uh, I mean, the, the old uh, um, church soloist that was singing... Uh, uh, um, the, the propers uh, in, in, in in Latin, but maybe very poor settings. So, so think of something like that. And uh, when the uh, Americans uh, then read, oh, we can get rid of all that. We can sing everything in English. Let's get rid of that. Uh, and let's not, not continue this kind of music. So I think the uh, onset was a little bit different. And then uh, in the United States, uh, um, there has never been a binding hymnal after Vatican II. There are many different publishers with very commercial interests, as you pointed out, that are promoting uh, their music. That's a little bit different uh, in Germany, for instance, because there's always been a binding uh, a hymnal for all the German-speaking diocese in Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. And they have their little uh, local um, diocesan uh, appendix or so, but there is one binding hymnal. And in the United States, uh, the publishers uh, really compete uh, and of course, they uh, produce so much new music all the time, and uh, uh, you have them uh, promote that uh, uh, with very professional uh, uh, recordings, with professional uh, bands, orchestras, instrumentations. Uh, it sounds like a Eurovision co song contest. Uh, and now they go often after the market. Right, right. And, and then, of course, if you try to do that in your parish with uh, singers that are not quite that good and maybe you have one guitar and I don't know maybe another instrument it will not sound the same and the one thing uh, that uh, this music is participatory it is not because especially with so much new music the people in the pews who are supposedly uh, uh, to participate in in the song they don't know it it's too difficult it's too much new music so uh, the, the one thing that was so big, the uh, active participation of the people, that is really not happening in a lot of this uh, contemporary music. 
but also because uh, there is a, a, a very big misconception. The music in the liturgy is not for the people, but it's for the glory of God and the sanctification of the people. The glory of God comes first. So you cannot edify yourself if first you don't give glory in an appropriate way to God. An appropriate way is not like that you have to sing my music or Gregorian chant, but music that has those characteristics that were also emphasized by Pius X that make this music, uh, you know, uh, adaptable for the worship. About the, the Gregorian chant, uh, the pride of place, um, uh, and then they say uh, ceteris paribus, no? Uh, the, in English, uh, you say uh, with the, uh, I would say in English, uh, when the, uh, equal to the equal, other. Uh, um, yeah, being equal to the other. Being yeah. equal to the other. But that is also misinterpreted. Because this does not mean that Gregorian chant is on the, on the same level of the other repertoires. It means that if you have to make a choice between Gregorian chant in another repertoire, you should choose Gregorian chant if you can make a choice. There is an article uh, I already mentioned about uh, this by in Italian by Don Gilberto Sessantini on Vox Gregoriana, that is a nice newsletter uh, about uh, this topic. And he say, uh, explain this. So I think there is, and the last, and then I will ask Professor Milanese, uh, the last I want to say is that unfortunately, especially some German uh, theologians uh, have given a uh, wrong interpretation about the Vatican II Sacrosanctum Concilium. Uh, I uh, remember, for example, uh, Rahner or I think Grillmeyer, and this is uh, uh, this was Cardinal Ratzinger already said. They say when they say, oh, the the repertoire of the church is a, a treasure that has to be preserved. And, and they say, oh yeah, it has to be preserved, but in concert. So no, not in the liturgy, uh, you know. So uh, that, that what this is what Cardinal Ratzinger denounced that uh, they interpret, you know, in this very wrong way, because the Sacrosanto Concilium never say, you need to preserve this for the museum or for the concert, but this is for the, the liturgy, uh, Professor Milanese. Oh yes, uh, of course, uh, the danger is always again to uh, make a, a further collection of platitudes, but I perfectly agree with you that, uh, also with uh, Dr. Buchholz, that um, in the text of the Second Vatican Council, the, there is a, a and B and B and A, and uh, there was a, a little book. Uh, well, it was a, a bit too nervous for my taste, but was not stupid. It was a little book of about uh, twenty-five years ago or so by Michael Davies that was called uh, "Liturgical Bombs in the uh, in the know. Text of Vatican II." Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, So uh, I mean, it was a, a little bit too sharp. I am milder as. <laughs> But anyhow, uh, there, was a, there was a good point there. Uh, well, uh, two points. Uh, first, uh, again, what is tradition? Uh, there was this idea of interrupting a tradition and build a completely, a completely new church. This is, of course, impossible. Um, if you, um, if I would have been asked the same question uh, some years ago, I would have replied, it's a problem of language. But because, uh, of course, I, I, I studied musical composition when I was young, as everyone, but um, I, I think that now I have changed my point of view. It's not basically a problem of language, because it is true that we have second class music performed by fourth class musicians, and there was a third something <laughs> that I, I forgot now. Um, in other words, that a lot of, of music written for liturgy is uh, the sort of waste basket or little bin uh, of, of, of uh, nowadays music. This is true. But uh, I don't believe that this is a problem basically of language. Um, uh, it was, it was my, my, my point of view years ago. I'm, 
I now I share the the judgment of Ratzinger himself that basically the problem is a problem of faith of the church. So music is a language and the language must say something. If we don't have anything to say, we cannot say anything. This is the problem. So uh, I'm a bit radical now. Uh, take the, for example, the Holy Mass. If you don't know what is this kind of liturgy, what is the Holy Mass? How on earth are you uh, allowed, I would say, to write music for something that you do not know? If you interpret the Mass as a sort of gathering of people who uh, uh, talk together, who who read a, a funny text of many years ago, and they comment about the the problem of uh, of environment of the like, and it is all in a sort of horizontal point of view, as Ratzinger puts it. You cannot write church music. You will write probably good good music for. A, 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 you know, for a family gathering, for a family, a family uh, dinner or the like, but it won't be church music. So uh, language is a problem that was probably worse uh, 25 or 30 years ago. I think that now the problem is more radical. It's a problem of the faith of the church. And it is, of course, very, very difficult difficult problem and demanding not only for us as musicians but also for intellectuals for the clergy and so on uh, i want to ask you a last question to conclude our program and before that uh, i want to remind everyone that uh, we are presenting my book uh, Forever I Will Sing, a short history of Catholic circle music. You can find it on Amazon, any other platform. It can be uh, uh, both in, uh, in uh, paperback version or ebook version. So you can find in a lot of uh, different versions. And uh, about this book, I also want to tell you that it's available in Chinese. Uh, of course, I cannot tell you the title in Chinese because uh, really I cannot, but I can tell you that you can find information uh, right into the email that is here under uh, the, the banner here, catholic at cuhk.edu.hk. And uh, this is the, the, the uh, version. And also I want to invite you to like this Chorus Master a YouTube channel, and I want to uh, conclude with a, a new uh, a question that uh, I uh, want to ask our two uh, guests to answer because uh, my answer is in the book. My answer, I mean, my hypothesis is in the book because it's a very difficult question. And the difficult question is this we have spoken a little about the some historical points, and then we talk about the the recent years, recent decades, but uh, we should also try to see, because we call this talk uh, between past and present challenges, but there are also the future challenges. So according to your opinion, very briefly, what are the more important future challenges about sacred music? Who want to start? You, uh, Dr. Buchholz. Well, uh, of course, the uh, uh, challenge uh, for the immediate future is uh, uh, the COVID-19 uh, uh, situation that has basically uh, put sacred music on, on the mute button, <laughs> uh, so to speak. I mean, uh, um, here in, in this country, uh, basically choirs are not prohibited, uh, are prohibited uh, uh, in the congregation. Uh, 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 singing is either uh, also prohibited or, or very minimalized. Uh, uh, so that, that, of course, is, is something uh, um, we hope that is temporary, but this uh, maybe um, uh, this temporary situation may be longer than uh, anybody uh, expects right now. So uh, what we have done uh, for the near foreseeable future here is uh, uh, we usually have uh, uh, 
given the canter, uh, um, some antiphons uh, uh, um, to sing. And since we did not want to do everything uh, in, in Latin, we actually, uh, there are now a number of very good English uh, settings of the proper antiphons. And uh, so this actually is a chance uh, to, to explore a new repertoire. I mean, uh, we have an English saying, uh, uh, if you have lemons, uh, make lemonade, uh, or yeah. uh, my uh, uh, variation of that, uh, 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 seek the good behind any evil. So I mean, this is a terrible situation, but I think uh, um, one of them is maybe a possibility to, to study and really explore a, a, a more a repertoire that can be done at this point. Um, I think um, one of the things that we have encouraged here is a good new compositions. And there are new compositions that are good. They are scripture based. Uh, uh, they are based on the texts of the mass uh, and they are, uh, are singable. So, uh, I mean, since not the uh, entire liturgy is, is, is in Latin, I think this is maybe a good time also for composers uh, to go uh, and say, okay, uh, um, not much that is being performed right now, but it's uh, definitely a time uh, to write something and uh, for us performers uh, uh, to study and do uh, more research um, for a repertoire that is suitable. Thank you. Professor Milanese? Oh, yes. Mm. Of course, the the point is for me always what we, what is the reason for of our work as church musicians, and uh, um, because you know, uh, of course, I'm a musicologist, but I have a lot of practical activity within uh, the liturgy. So my answer is first uh, the problem of faith, as I mentioned before. Mm. So. The second is, of course, a correct and a correct, a true, not correct, a true understanding of what is liturgy. And third, music. Because if we reverse, if we reverse the process, we don't get anything at all. Um, so what I see in the, in the future is, uh, of course, uh, impossible to say because um, I think that things are really changing and uh, in many countries uh, such as in France for example the percentage of traditional liturgies is higher and higher and this is not good news uh, in a sense because it means that the figures of people attending mass is dropping in a dramatic way so, um, uh, you remember the great German philosopher of last century, Martin Heidegger, who used to say, uh, we are in a time where the gods of the past have disappeared and the gods of the future are not yet here. I think we are in this sort of, of uh, to use Tolkien's uh, word of, of Middle Earth, uh, uh, or in 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 Saxon, in Old Saxon of Middle Earth, and uh, we are in the in the middle. We must uh, we must uh, try to to follow. I think this uh, mm, this uh, uh, construction first is the faith. The faith uh, is uh, communicated through the liturgy, and the, the liturgy finds in music its best, best linguistic shape. This is how I see things. Personally, I, I don't write a lot of music, I do sometimes. And I never, I never, never, never follow the so-called Neo-Gregorian style, never, never. I use a completely modern language. But of course, being a scholar in Gregorian chant, I think that the treatment of words <laughs> <laughs> will reflect in some way the the school and the and the, what uh, I could have learned from Gregorian chant. So again, don't copy what has been done. Try to learn what has been done before, and use the language of our time. This is my point of view, at least. Thank you very much. And I want to thank you both because uh, I think this was a very interesting and engaging discussion uh, about uh, a topic that is very dear to all of us. 
And uh, I want to um, encourage our viewers to like uh, the channel uh, Coral Master. And I ask you, you two, to wait a few seconds after we have finished so uh, we can, uh, you know, we can say hello properly to each other. And uh, in the meantime, we say uh, goodbye to our viewer and uh, we will uh, hopefully resume soon our our um, uh, our broadcasting so thank you very much thank you uh -huh.